Representative Garcia, immigrant to immigrant, um, this this talk is is um, you, it, it really bothers you. You've got a lot of different you're you're sort of the definition of intersectionality. You've got a lot of ways in which you identify as a member of Congress, as an American, uh, as as a gay man, as a politician and as an immigrant. This this really this this hatred talk about immigrants um, is, is getting under your skin. Uh, it's infuriating. I mean, I can't I, I I am so sick of Donald Trump and his anti-immigrant rhetoric, the way he just attacks us over and over and over again. Uh, and I came to this country as a young child. I was an educator, a teacher in the classroom for 10 years. I became a member of Congress. I became a citizen in my early 20s. I'm a patriot. I love this country. My family are immigrants. So this idea that somehow immigrants haven't helped build this country or contribute is a warped reality that Donald Trump lives in. He's do he is doing this uh, to get to his base. He's doing this to encourage the worst in people. What he is saying is completely anti-American. He he is running a campaign that is the opposite of our values, the opposite of what this country was actually built upon. And so uh, I am sick and tired. Immigrants are sick and tired of being uh, his, essentially his playthings. His, he always scapegoats our issues. He treats people in our community. Um, this way, and, and we're tired of it. We've got to wear ourselves with Donald Trump. It is time for us to defeat him one last time. We've got to unite to do so. Michael Beschloss, uh, as a guy who thinks about this economically, I always think, boy, you know, if we just look at the math, we, we need a lot of immigrants in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but as Rachel pointed out earlier, historically, this is a thing. Uh, politicians in America have capitalized on anti-immigrant sentiment with every group of immigrants that's come through this country, bar none. And it has been done to effect in the past. It's been, both been done in America in the past, and it's certainly been done, as you and I have discussed, by uh, dictators and authoritarians in other parts of the world. Why is Donald Trump, other than the fact that it has worked in the past, what, what do you think is behind this increasing volume in the rhetoric, the, 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 the racist rhetoric that Donald Trump is using? I agree with you that Donald Trump probably has not read the history of the know-nothings in the mid-19th century that campaigned against immigrants and Catholics and certainly did not like black people and certainly didn't like Jewish people. And all that is also true of the Ku Klux Klan at its height in the 1920s. Yes, I will concede that Donald Trump has not read that history, but he does know that this works. We have every reason to assume that he believes this. His first wife reported that he was fascinated by Hitler's speeches. If you go back to his announcement speech at Trump Tower 2015, the way he talked about Mexican-American immigrants and Mexicans who were coming here, it sounded very much like an echo of Hitler's language in Mein Kampf in 1925. But at the same time, Trump is always someone who wants to see how do you succeed, how do you become powerful? He was 22 years old in 1968. Uh, his family was in Queens. George Wallace ran as a segregationist, got at one point during the fall of 1968, 25 percent of Americans with his racist and segregationist rhetoric. But most of all, Ali, no president, no major party candidate for president in the last hundred years has ever spoken the way that Donald Trump did in the last few days talking about poisoning the blood, other occasions talking about vermin. This is something that separates him from all of American history in the last 100, uh, 100 years, at least presidential history. Let's remember that and take it extremely seriously. I think that's important. Uh, Representative Garcia, one of the things that Michael and I have talked about in the past and others and I have talked about in the past is that if it were only just Donald Trump, it would be one thing. Um, there are, and I played it earlier, there are lots of opportunities that, that Republicans are given in the House on television television shows to denounce this kind of conversation, to distance themselves from this conversation. At best, you'll get a don't pay attention to the language or that's just Trump being Trump. Uh, at some point, the Republican Party it has to be held to account for the fact that they, they let this continue to happen. It's just incredible, the hold that Donald Trump has on the entire party. I mean, the entire Republican Party, particularly the leadership, is essentially turned into one big MAGA show. I mean, they do whatever Donald Trump wants. I mean, that clip of Lindsey Graham, Lindsey Graham is a coward. He should be ashamed of himself uh, for not being able to stand up to Donald Trump. And Donald Trump now pulls the strings in the Senate. 
in the House of Representatives. He has everyone that he wants in power. Uh, his lieutenants uh, are, are in charge. And it's the Donald Trump show all the time in Washington, D.C. So it's really important for us right now across the country to listen to what Donald Trump is saying. He is telling us he wants to be a dictator. He is telling us he wants to be an authoritarian. He is telling us what he thinks of people that are diverse and different and people that built this country. And so he is laying out his plan for what a second Donald Trump term would look like. And that should concern every American in this country. And we should be calling out all of these Republicans and the, just the, hip, the hypocrites that, um, that right now are ruling uh, the MAGA extreme GOP. It's, it's just a shame they're not standing up to them. Uh, the rest of us are going to have to. Uh, this is not partisan politics. This is about, as you said, Representative Garcia, um, our actual values. Thanks to both of you, it gentlemen. Is. Robert Garcia is the uh, congressman from California. He's a member of the House Oversight and Homeland Security uh, Committees. Michael Beschloss, of course, is our favorite historian. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has rich friends, decades-long friendships with wealthy conservatives who have paid for his luxury vacations, a house, private school tuition, a souped-up RV, Clarence Thomas also seems to know that's not normal because he's never disclosed these gifts. Now a new report in ProPublica re uh, reveals why these rich conservatives may have found a way to befriend Clarence Thomas. Quote, in early January 2000, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas was at a five-star beach resort in Sea Island, Georgia, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. After almost a decade on the court, Thomas had grown frustrated with his financial situation, according to friends. He had recently started raising his young grandnephew, and Thomas's wife was soliciting advice on how to handle the new expenses. At the resort, Thomas gave a speech at an off-the-record conservative conference. He found himself seated next to a Republican member of Congress on the flight home. The two men talked, and the lawmaker left the conversation worried that Thomas might resign. Congress should give Supreme Court justices a pay raise, Thomas told him. If lawmakers didn't act... One or more justices may leave soon, maybe in the next year. The congressman was Cliff Stearns of Florida, who, according to ProPublica, wrote a letter to Clarence Thomas saying, quote, as we agreed, it is worth a lot to Americans to have the Constitution properly interpreted. We must have the proper incentives here, too, end quote. Stern's office soon sought help from a lobbying firm working on the issue, and he delivered a speech on the House floor about judges' salaries getting eroded by inflation. Now, Clarence Thomas started to talk about resigning, and suddenly he had all these new friends. Clarence Thomas's friends have sent him and his wife, Ginny, on all expenses paid vacations, flown them on private jets, paid his nephew's tuition, and even paid for his mother's house, which she got to live in rent free. And now, despite not getting a salary bump, Clarence Thomas's views on his salary have changed. Right now, what is the compensation of a justice of the Supreme Court? Oh, goodness, I think it's plenty. <laughs> My wife and I are doing fine. We don't, we don't live extravagantly, but we are fine. A few weeks after Clarence Thomas said, we are fine, he boarded billionaire Harlan Crow's private plane to Indonesia for a vacation on Harlan Crow's yacht, none of which was properly disclosed at the time. Senator Elizabeth Warren put it bluntly, quote, Justice Clarence Thomas wanted to boost his income and Republican billionaires were happy to give him a lavish lifestyle so he wouldn't resign from the Supreme Court. It's corruption, plain and simple, end quote. Joining us now, New York Times opinion columnist Jamel Bowie. He has written many columns on Supreme Court ethics and discussed them on this program. He's also co-host of the podcast, Unclear and Present Danger. Jamel, good to see you. Thank you for, uh, for, for being here. There's, there's a little piece of context about this conversation that, that Clarence Thomas may have had with this um, uh, congressman on an airplane in, 20, in the year 2000, and that was that there was an election coming up. And there was a possibility that, that Al Gore could become the president of the United States. And if, if Justice Thomas were to resign in that initial period, there was a possibility that uh, a, 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 a democratically appointed justice could take his place. All of a sudden, it became an imperative. It wasn't a stated threat, but it was an imperative that you probably don't want me to resign because I don't think I'm making enough money. I think that's right. I think that's very much what. Thomas had likely had in mind, right? He's aware of the, of the presidential cycle. And I'm sure Republican lawmakers are also very aware that this was a possibility. I want to add a, a thing about this entire kind of situation, because I think it's a really 
it, it, it illustrates how this kind of corruption works. It's not quid pro quo necessarily, right? It's not Thomas soliciting money so that he'll, he'll change his votes. It's very much, these are all ideological allies, and it's very much about keeping Thomas in the fold, about keeping Thomas satisfied and happy, about t keeping Thomas, sat, you know, satisfied with the work that he's doing. And that's sort of what the, the, the purpose of this is, to sort of smooth the, the rough edges of this particular uh, situation everyone finds themselves in. And I think it's like an important thing to recognize that this isn't, this isn't so much Thomas saying, I'll do this if you, I'll, I'll rule your way if you support me financially. It's more, this is hard <laughs> and I don't make as much money as I want. Uh, and I think that should be rectified. Uh, and I, I want to put up ProPublica as part of their article uh, sort, sort of gave some comparisons about what people earn. The median income for an American worker is $60,000, means half of all Americans earn more, half uh, earn less. Uh, members of Congress, 174,000. Associate Supreme Court justices, 274,000. And a, a partner at a high paying law firm, uh, $7.2 million they can earn. Uh, Clearly, uh, Clarence Thomas had choices, and people who get into public service uh, make choices. 274000 is many times what the uh, median American wage is, but there's a choice to be in public service. At some point, if you don't want to work for that kind of money, you've got options. Right. That's my very much my view is no one's forcing Clarence Thomas to be a Supreme Court justice. And so if he feels that the job is not remunerative enough for him, then he can simply leave it. It's still, he'll still maintain the prestige of having been a Supreme Court justice. So I, I make no mistake, I'm not particularly sympathetic to this, but I do think that it is useful to sort of understand how this kind of corruption works, right? It's about keeping Thomas on the good side of his allies. Everyone's sympathetic with each other here. This isn't the case of Harlan Crow having to persuade Clarence Thomas of anything. It's more, much more a case of making sure that Thomas does not feel uh, aggrieved at all uh, while he has this job, especially since, uh, as you mentioned, right, a, a high paying lawyer at a private firm can make a lot of money, millions of dollars. And Tom, these, these are the legal circles that Thomas is going to be in anyway. So this is compounding any sense of like grievance he may feel about his own pay, that he's comparing himself to his peers who are much more better off than he is. But again, the big picture is this is how Clarence Thomas feels. He can just find another job. <laughs> right. And, and, and clearly he can make a lot more money uh, doing it. Jamel, good to see you, my friend. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. This is what happens in Iran. People write things, they say things, and then they are in jail. And she will have whatever you think a trial looks like in Iran. It's not entirely likely that she will be exonerated because that's not how it goes in Iran these days. Yeah, I have to say that Nargis knows that freedom is not free. Yeah. She is brave enough. And she has a dream to end the Islamic Republic, to have a secular democracy. And that's her crime. Yeah. That's a crime of millions of Iranian people yes. who want to have a normal country. And I have to say that, I mean, when you say you, you were actually saying to the audiences, to Americans, that resistance is alive, is, is, uh, is there. I have to say that the flame of the revolution is still burning because, yeah. you know, as you, you mentioned, they're using rape as a weapon of war. But at the same time, those who have been suffering a lot, they sh you know, go to the cameras everywhere and yes, say that yes. we are here. Yes, it is amazing. Uh, you, you, in 2009, it was close to amazing. It was still amazing, but the, the government put it down. And what we have seen in the last few years is constant attempts, people, it, it, daily. I mean, it's, it's not even, we don't talk about it in the news every day, but there are constant, uh, there's constant rebellion yeah. against the government. Woman life freedom yeah. became, became part of the norm, daily life of yeah. people resisting, not only women, men, yeah. those men who got executed. They were the one actually being brainwashed by the Islamic Republic that you own your sisters, you own your daughters. But they were the one brave one in front line, shoulder to shoulder with their sisters and saying that, no, 
we don't own our sisters. We want to have freedom, dignity, equality, democracy. And I have to say that, you know, I've been invited on uh, MSNBC a lot. And thank you so much for not burying the human rights situation on their, you know, different news. But I've, I've been warning the rest of the world about the danger of the terrorist regime in Iran. Mm. And what happened? Now the same rapist, the same terrorist targeting, uh, you know, the civilians in Israel, uh, October 7. And that's the tactic of not only Islamic Republic, Hamas and Taliban using rape like weapon to crush, uh, you know, any uprising in the Middle East. What does the future look like for Iran? And I, I ask you this for two reasons. One is there's a, 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 an active movement for democracy. But on the other hand, you're right. We hear about Iran every day in a different context as, as probably the most important power now in the Middle East. I think it's eclipsed Saudi Arabia as the most influential power in the Middle East in terms of spreading ideology and, and creating unrest. I have to say that um, the future is bright because the young generation in Iran, women in Iran, shoulder to shoulder with men, they have you know, they, they, they made up their mind. They're going to end this regime. Mm -hmm. But with the help and support of the democratic countries, less girls and women face rape in prison. Less innocent people will suffer and get killed. Not only that, an Iran without the Islamic Republic will benefit the rest of the world. Look, mm -hmm. the Revolutionary Guards not only sponsoring Hamas, uh, Houthi in Yemen, they are sending drones to Putin to kill innocent Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. So I have to say that this is the moment. The, the Sakharov Award from European Parliament went to Mahsa Jina Amini. The Nobel Peace Prize this year went to Nargis Mohammadi. Right. The real prize is when the democratic countries get united and hear the voice of Iranian people to end this gender of What does that look like? Because that's not war with Iran, obviously, what does it look like? How does the West show its support? That, that's that, why you say it's not war. The Islamic Republic is, support, is, is helping Putin, is helping Hamas to war, that attacking democracy, Islamic Republic is backing them. The Revolutionary Guards is backing them. What can we do? The, the, the same uh, that the, the, the democratic countries address Putin, they have to address uh, Khamenei and his gang of killers, the U.S. government can take the lead. I mean, I'm very pleased that the U.S. government did that to kick out the Islamic Republic uh, from one of the top women's body at the United Nations. Here we are. Now the U.S. government can take the lead to ask the G7 countries to designate the Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization. You saw that how Hamas, you know, taking the lifeless bodies of women, being raped and filming them. Raping is in the DNA of the Islamic Republic, and Islamic Republic is everywhere. So if we look for stability in the region, in the world, we have to end Islamic Republic.